morning. My name's uh, Siddharth Chandran. I think many of you will know me. Um, I'm a neurologist, and one of the great pr uh, privileges and pleasures I've had since being in Edinburgh um, since 2010-11 is uh, leading the Ewan MacDonald Centre. So the Ewan MacDonald Centre um, was founded by Donald, who is here, and his son Ewan, who um, uh, developed motor neuron disease as a young investment banker. And then Donald and Ewan had the foresight to see the research power, potentially, within Edinburgh that could try and make a difference. And therein lay the creation and the genesis of the center. And the center is not complicated. Uh, the vision is through research to try and improve the lives and the outcomes of people living with motor neuron disease. And as an anchor, therefore, you need quality research. Now, this university, uh, through centuries, has been a powerhouse of research. And, and we've, we've just had the day session in the uh, McEwen Hall. You only have to crane your neck and look up at the ceiling. And you see all those individual panels talking about the importance of scholarship, science, evidence, research, and wisdom. So the Ewan MacDonald Center is about capturing that. So today's session it will be, um, each of our speakers will speak, and then there will be a Q&A. And during the Q&A, well, about 15 minutes, there are about 100 people, I believe, on the webinar, which is why I'm standing here. We've got Emily. Um, I think Emily's giving the final talk. So Emily Beswick is in her final year of a PhD, which is a mixed funded model, a lot of that we've done. Uh, very interesting area. It's also in partnership with Sharon Abrahams in terms of psychology, but also about the power of digital and using digital um, to improve both uh, patient management but also trials and research. Next to uh, Emily is Alessandra. Alessandra um, did a master's in Edinburgh, having studied her undergraduate studies in Italy. Uh, and she stayed here. Um, we're very grateful and pleased she stayed here. And I hope she will continue to stay here, Alessandra. Um, so she's doing a PhD uh, using human stem cell and whether that could be a model to both understand the disease, but in Alessandra's case, really to help accelerate discovery of potential medicines. So if you, if you study human disease using human cells, you don't have to have gone to medical school to work out that's, that's probably a good start to go into human trials. Was if you've been studying a human disease with rat cells, guess what? What happens when you go to a clinical trial? I'm exaggerating to make the point, but you get the principle. Then we've got Chris Henstridge, who's one of ours, in, and here we're talking about Scotland. Remembering that Ewan MacDonald Centre is not an Edinburgh entity, it's pan Scotland. I should have said that. We have 200 uh, plus members, and we're Scottish full stop. It, it, nobody's interested if you're from Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee at all. Not at all. No patient is ever interested in the geography of research, they're just interested in the outcomes. So Chris did his PhD with Tara, I think in, in Edinburgh, and now has established a thriving group in Dundee. Savanka, many of you will know. Savanka's the future, he's probably sick of hearing that. Savanka leads so much uh, in Edinburgh, and he leads MND Smart, the trial, okay? A really important person. Savanka, we're relying on you to deliver the knockout blow, uh, which I think you will. And then Judy Newton, um, again, many of you will know, we're bloody lucky uh, to have Judy. So Judy's a nurse consultant. This is a rare un and unusual post. Very few of these in the UK. So she's the nurse consultant for motor neuron disease for the, all of Scotland and oversees all of the healthcare professionals, majority of nurses that deliver care. Okay? But in addition, Judy's also the deputy director of the Anne Rowling Clinic and runs a lot of operations amongst other colleagues. So that's, that, that's our panel. They're each going to speak for about eight minutes. At the end of that, we're going to have a Q&A. Judith, she prefers to be called. <laughs> OK, there you go. Good evening. I uh, hope everybody can hear me, and I hope everybody online can also equally hear me. Um, thank you very much for asking me to present this evening a bit about MND specialist nursing. And I'm particularly delighted that Alex is here um, in his chief nursing role um, to hear about how 
you've supported and, and the investment that you've given to MND Nursing in Scotland and actually what we've been able to do. So thank you for your time tonight. It's really, really uh, special. Thank you. Okay, so what is the scope of the problem for motor neuron disease in Scotland? So we have roughly 200 new cases a year. Um, and at any one time, we have approximately 450 people living with the disease. And when you look at those numbers, it doesn't really seem an awful lot, but the impact is huge for the population and the speed of decline um, is also equally very, very important. So 200 people were diagnosing across Scotland, across all 14 health boards, and at any one time around about 450 living with the, with the disease. It has an economic impact greater than any other uh, neurological condition, and we know that by audits that we've carried out. And the reason of that economic impact is because as the condition declines, people need more care, they need more infrastructure, they need more help with housing and social care and support. So that in itself is a, is a really big burden. Uh, and we also know that there's a need for harmonisation of care. So clinical care, how we look after people from diagnosis right through to end of life, we need to make sure that we get that right from the Shetland Isles right down to the borders. And um, so I'll explain how we've been able to achieve that. So we have got a history of change um, and a little bit of a timeline here. So from 1989, um, Siddharthan um, alluded to it and certainly spoke about Rob Swingler and the MND register. So the first MND register in Scotland was established. Um, and really what that, when we, when we actually think back on those 30 years, the thought process going into actually why is it important that we capture how many people we diagnose uh, and look after was really actually very innovative at that time. So we've been able to build on that over the years. So we've got a really long data history of over 30 years of understanding our population. In 2009, there was a Scottish Neuro Neurological Standards of Care, and that was published. That came from the Scottish Government to say, this is how people with neurological conditions should be looked after. And motor neuron disease, even though it's classed as a rare disease, was in that publication. 2014, the Ewan MacDonald Centre uh, commissioned a, an audit, and actually my predecessor and mentor and friend, Shuna Colville, was um, instrumental in that audit. And actually, Shuna um, and Robert and somebody else called Rayburn and Forbes went through all of the archives, um, looking at the MND register, pulling the notes. We've now got everything electronic, so it's a lot easier for us. But really, a very critical um, audit carried out in 2014 that noted the one thing, and that was that care across Scotland was sporadic. Where, no where people documented notes was different in wherever you lived, and actually the way that nurses or doctors assessed patients was also different. So one of the things, the outcomes of that audit was to say we actually need harmonisation of care and we need standardisation of care. So in 2015, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, there's a picture down here on, on the right hand side, um, was inspired by what we can only really, s there's, there's people here, uh, in the pictures here, who really have informed and made big decisions for us. And they're not politicians, they're people who've lived with MND. So we've got Lucy Lynn taught here, we've got Ewan and Doddy Weir, and we've got Gordon Aikman. And Gordon Aikman was um, in the Better Together campaign. Uh, he was working as head of research for there. And as you can see, he was um, influential with all of the politicians, not just one party, across the board. And unfortunately, Gordon was diagnosed at the age of 29 and he died at the age of 31. In those few years, what he did for MND nursing and clinical care is un unbelievable. He directly asked Nicola Sturgeon and he said that the MND nurses who previously were funded by MND Scotland, and there were seven of us, I was one of those original seven, uh, should be actually um, commissioned by the NHS. And the story in politics goes that Nicola Sturgeon led by her heart and not her head. And she, fu she agreed to fund um, the doubling of the MND nurses, £750,000 per year. Um, and uh, we, we doubled the nurses and we then said that maybe there should be somebody in a leadership role. And I was very fortunate to get that consultant post. But without these people, we wouldn't be where we are today. And there's absolutely no doubt about that. 
So 2015, we saw that doubling of numbers of nurses and actually Siddharthan and Savankar, along with um, all the other MND consultants, said this is a really special moment. We will never see this happen again. It will never be replicated. We need to make sure that we make that investment. And it's something that I hope, Alex, that I feed back to your team to say is that that investment of £750,000 can actually get us a lot. So 2017, we looked at actually how can we marry all of these timelines together and we introduced what we call Care MND. So Care MND, sorry, I'll just go back, sorry. Um, so uh, just to, to go back, sorry, the unique investment in nursing in Scotland, there is only myself. I'm the one uh, dedicated nurse consultant for any neurological condition and I'm now helping to advise the government as well on some other neurological conditions. There's three MND nurse consultants in the United Kingdom, two are both based down in London. We have, because of this generous donation of funding, we have a 1 to 44 patient nurse ratio. Now for people in the audience who are unfamiliar with nursing ratios, uh, for MS you might be one full-time nurse to thousands uh, or Parkinson's disease. So for us to have this ratio means that we can really look after people from diagnosis right through to end of life care, their bespoke clinical care. Um, but more importantly, what the MND nurses are now doing is we're now integrating research as part of their role. So we are getting people to help us with research from diagnosis and that's crucial. So I, ha I can say we have got a highly specialised team of nursing. There's a, a, an array here of, of us. Um, and you can see some of us all looking very nice. That was at the, um, one of the, the dinners that we were at a couple of years ago. Um, they are very highly specialised and they're able to do um, whatever it is that we ask of them as well as look after patients exceptionally well. So CARE MND stands for Clinical Audit Research and Evaluation. Um, and what we wanted to do was to integrate routine NHS care with research opportunities. So we have a comprehensive monitoring of every single patient now in Scotland, regardless of where you live. We have a platform for clinical trials. We can promote tissue banking, research and post-mortem authorisations. We can now develop um, equity and improve quality of care because we can audit directly from the, the care platform. And we can increase patient participation by training research uh, nurses to talk about research, gain consent, and they can also um, take blood samples, etc., for us. So when they're at people's houses, they can say, we have got a clinical drug trial. It's really important that you're on that to help us. Um, so the nurses are really integral for that. So you can have a look at our website here. It's online at caremnd.org.uk. And as you can see here from this landing page, there's a speci specific tab for patients and on that tab we've got where can you get help, how can you find your, your local nurse. Um, we've also got um, examples of all the research studies so people can click on videos and see what's going on. And then there's also a section for um, professionals as well. So we try and have this updated during COVID. I use this a lot. I referred a lot about how we might look after patients because we shielded 70% of our patients. Um, so this was really quite an important tool. The other thing that's happened because of Care MND was during the pandemic, we had about four nurses that were redeployed. And I was anchored down here in Edinburgh. I did some work with public health. But I was also able to help some of the nurses that were redeployed look after their patient because all the information was on one platform. So regardless, I could phone up patients in, in Shetland and I could see what the nurses up there had done and I could continue that on. That's unheard of. So we had that was a, a, incredible. We were able to monitor every patient during the pandemic. So the process of care MND, the MND clinical nurse specialist, first of, all, first of all, notifies the register of a new case. So that's us getting our epidemiology. We're able to stamp that at the point of diagnosis. Bearing in mind our standards and our NICE guidelines um, or, uh, uh, inform us that we should be seeing patients within two working days of a diagnosis. And we've got a zero day um, uh, waiting list just now. So nurses are seeing our patients at point of diagnosis. That captures what we call the incidence, so at 200 people uh, a year, as well as the prevalence capture as well. So that's why we can actually say with 99.98% accuracy, we know exactly where our population is. And that's critical for uh, our research. 
the nurses then start this national performa and this was something that we worked on together um, in 2015 2016 where we looked at the nice guidelines we all said right what are the important questions that we should be asking and we developed a one document that's it's now rolled out across scotland and all the nurses use that they this is all online and i'd be happy to show anybody after the session if they want to have a look at that so we've got very specific clinical questions when do you need a feeding tube do you have palliative care um, do you need a, a speech and language therapy referral? We've got all of that noted on there on this one um, uh, uh, platform. And that then informs us on clinical care and we can then carry out robust audits of care. And again, over the years, we've now been able to publish a huge number of audits of clinical care to see exactly where are we falling down, how are we prescribing Royazole, how are we uh, fitting our feeding tubes, et cetera, and at what time? So I can then go back to government or health boards and inform directly on that. The third and most crucial aspect is that patients at that point are then invited to, to come on and to take part in research, and the patients need to um, consent into that section. So we've got roughly 10% of the 450 people who said we don't want to take part, and that's absolutely fine, but remember, still audit their care. However, um, for the rest, the 85, 90% that we have got, they have said, yes, we are happy to take part in research. And that's where one of my jobs comes in, in that I will then phone up people or I'll contact people to say we've got three trials or, or one trial going, but we've got two observational studies. Would you like to take part? So this is what it looks like, the clinical side, as you can see here. And if you imagine a layer of an onion, behind each green tab, there's a series of other questions. The nurses complete this over the duration of a person's um, uh, um, illness. Uh, and at the end, I make sure that all the fields are captured so that we have got a really good comprehensive data set. Because of course, if we're doing clinical audit, we want to make sure that our data is accurate. You can just see here, I'll, I'll not. Um, I'll be very happy to show people here, but again, so if Siddharth and Savankar, Chris came to me and said, actually what I'm looking for is I'm looking for 100 people with ALS, with a bulbar onset, who have not been in any other trials, I can go straight to the data set and I can pull that as well. For each person that we've got on Care MND, we've got a full history from diagnosis right through. And I also log every single research study that that person has taken part in. So um, if it's been voice banking, if it's a clinical drug trial, um, if it's um, a neuropsychology uh, study, we can see exactly a 360 degree round profile of what every single person has taken part in and we've got the data to back that up as well. So it really is a rich resource for Scotland and the world. So facilitating and supporting approved research, we do DNA capture on every patient. We ask every patient if they would donate a sample of blood or saliva and the MND nurses will get that when they go out to see them. We've got ethically approved observa observational studies that I can recruit directly to. We have got the clinical drug trial, MND Smart and Savanka will speak about that. And we all have also got a post-mortem donation programme which then feeds into Chris's work. And this is something that the MND nurses are pioneering in Scotland. Uh, we speak to people about how they can help us. It's a huge legacy that patients can leave for us. And the nurses um, at bedside will go through the, the procedure with the family um, and the patient. And we've got the largest number of donations for any neurological condition in Scotland. So the nurses have done really, really well with that, as have the patients. So we can risk recruitment uh, specifically to an inclusion criteria. Um, we can re recruitment targets can be met. So again, if Sharon Abraham says I need 50 people, I can make sure that we can try and get that. We have got very low attrition. We've got positive patient engagement and we've got post-study feedback. So in summary, uh, it is a co-production between charity, university, government and the NHS. We have a validated clinical tool now with annual health board reports. We can capture the epidemiology and research information. We can improve standards of care through annual and audits. We can facilitate and support research and we can now shape and deliver clinical trials with patient and, fa uh, and family engagement. Thank you for listening. For time reasons, we're just going to roll on. Thank you very much, Judy. Chris. Thanks, Arthur. 
So I'm going to talk to you about the, the next step in the process uh, after um, what Judy mentioned about this um, post-mortem uh, donation and essentially trying to find clues from brains. So why do we study the post-mortem brain? Well, effectively, it's the most direct relevance to the human disease and the human condition. The way I imagine this is like all of the researchers who are working mo with model systems are trying to put together pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, but they don't have the picture to accurately put that puzzle together. So by a deep and um, comprehensive characterization of the post-mortem uh, brain material, we can provide that picture for the model system. Now I imagine a lot of you, when you think about brain banks, this is kind of what you think about, is literally brains in jars. And for a long time, that's what a brain bank would look like. Um, unfortunately, when you, when you do this with brains, it, it, it renders them almost ineffective for research. There's very harsh fixation chemicals used, and so you, there's not much you can essentially do with the brains other than look at their kind of shape and size. So it's not very responsive to changing technologies. But thankfully, new and modern brain banks are, are beginning to change this. And a very good example of that is the Edinburgh Brain Bank, which is run by uh, Professor Colin Smith here in Edinburgh. And the really important uh, factor here is, is uh, was alluded to very, very well by, by uh, Judith previously, was that we've got a very detailed clinical understanding of every single donor um, who donates their brain to research. And one of the particular focuses here you can see is, is um, uh, motor neuron disease uh, tissue collection. So this is uh, responsive to researchers' needs. So Colin Smith is very willing to adapt how the tissue is collected and processed depending on <coughs> uh, particular needs um, and researcher-based uh, technology. And this is an incredible Scottish resource for M&D research. So what does a human brain look like? Well, essentially, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to neuroanatomy before I go into some of the details of what we do with the brains. So it's essentially broken down into four lobes, and you can see the titles of those lobes spinning in the top right-hand side. But there are particular areas of the brain that are very important for particular functions. And the one that's particularly important uh, for the audience here is the, the motor cortex, which essentially controls all of your uh, movement and coordination. Now, the cortex is effectively the, the kind of surface of the brain, and even that can be broken down into uh, subregions and subdomains. You've probably heard of grey matter and white matter. And the grey matter, effectively, is the collection of the, the, the brain cell bodies. And the white matter is the, the wires that travel between the different brain cells and the brain areas connecting them together. Now, of course, again, of particular relevance to the audience here is uh, the motor system and how that's connected. So we have upper motor neurons that are found within the motor cortex. And this is a small part of uh, the brain that contains all of those cells which project down from the brain into the spinal cord. Some of these cells are, well, in fact, all of them are particularly large, so they can be m longer than a meter uh, in length, so they're huge cells. They travel down into the spinal cord where they connect with the lower motor neurons, which then project out and uh, connect with the nerve, uh, sorry, with the muscles and control uh, muscle movement. And the red circles that I put on the brain there, these uh, represent the connection points, so effectively, where different brain cells connect with each other and help to signal with each other and coordinate signaling through the, through the body. Um, and a very important aspect is that in ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the most common form of motor neuron disease, there's a breakdown or a dysfunction in both the upper motor neurons in the brain and the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord. So what kind of information can we extract from this post-mortem material? Well, we can collect and extract a huge amount of, inform of information, starting off with structural uh, information, so sort of gross anatomical changes from sort of shape and size of particular regions. We can look at individual cell types and get information on different cell types in the brain and how they may have changed and been affected by disease. We can look at subcellular compartments. So I mentioned synapses being the connection points between brain cells. We can look at those in great detail and also molecular analysis. So essentially with, with that kind of approach, we look at, or we can look at the building blocks uh, of cells. So all the way from essentially a brain down to its, uh, um, its individual protein components. <coughs> so some of the work that I focus on in particular uh, uh, is on the synapse and how these synapses or connection between brain cells change. So we have about 100 trillion synapses in our brain, which is one plus a huge number of zeros. And it's literally an astronomical number. So we have more synapses in our brain than there are stars in the galaxy. 
And because of that, each synapse, each connection point is incredibly small. So we're talking thousands of times smaller than the thickness of a single human hair. And if we had the ability to count a thousand of these synapses per second, it would still take us almost 32,000 years to count all of these synaptic connections in our brain. And why are they important? Well, one of the main hypotheses or one of the main features that we think may be driving motor neuron disease is called the dying back hypothesis, which states that there's a toxic, some sort of toxic insult happens at the synapse and the motor neurons then begin to die back from that synaptic connection. We still don't know what that synaptic, uh, sorry, what that toxic uh, factor is, but this is one of the major uh, hypotheses um, of motor neuron disease uh, dysfunction. Oh. So one of the technologies that we've uh, been using in the lab in Dundee, this is a technology and an approach that I learned here in Edinburgh before I moved to Dundee. It's called a ray tomography. And because these synapses are so small and so tiny, we have to cut the tissue extremely thin. And the only way we can do that is actually with a piece of diamond. Um, so it's an incredibly thin and incredibly sharp piece of diamond. This is a video here in the bottom left showing you how we cut the material. Um, I can see my postdoc, uh, sorry, my PhD students in the room at the back there. So Anna probably sees this video and repeat in her brain <laughs> uh, as she sleeps um, because Anna's cut literally hundreds, if not thousands of these ribbons um, to look at synapses. So then we stain these synapses and we um, reconstruct the tissue back into two dimensions and we can count them and we can look at proteins accumulating there. This is only possible thanks to the Edinburgh Rain Bank and their adaptability to technology. And we're one of only a handful of labs in the entire world that have the experience and the uh, resources to do this. So places, again, Scotland in an incredibly um, powerful position to use this type of technology to study brains. So what have we learned? I realize for uh, time's sake, we're, we're running quite uh, a little bit late, so I'm gonna kind of rush through this. But what we've learned from using this technology is that ALS patients with cognitive impairment, which make up around half of the ALS population, we found using this technology that um, they had a, a lower number of synaptic connections in the frontal part of their brain. And it associated with that, um, that clinical presentation of cognitive decline. So the reason that's important is it now gives us a focus. So we know that there's changes in the synaptic connections between these cells. So it's an area that now that we can focus on to increase our understanding of what's happening and potentially um, develop therapeutics to prevent that synaptic change and that synaptic breakdown. So ultimately, we can extract a huge amount of information from post-mortem material. It's an incredible resource to have the chance to look at it. And in Scotland, we're in a fantastic place to do that work thanks to the, uh, the Edinburgh Bain Bank and the, and the response um, uh, of their team. And effectively, what, what we want to do with this human uh, post-mortem analysis is really to inform disease modeling. So by providing that comprehensive, detailed characterization of the human material, it will inform much better uh, model systems for testing drugs and understanding disease, which all then feeds back into the brain material that we're doing, and it increases our understanding of what's happening in the brain. And I think that... Um, Fantastic segue. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Chris has effectively set up very well Alessandra who's going to tell us about how you might model human disease, MND, in a dish. Hi, everybody. <coughs> I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about the work I've been doing over my PhD here in Edinburgh, um, where I was trying to discover new treatments for motor neuron disease. Sorry. <laughs> So, um, as you've heard uh, from Judy so far, motor neuron disease is a very fatal and rapidly progressive disease. It is very difficult for me to exaggerate how bad this disease is. And yet, uh, even though there's been a lot of research going on uh, in motor neuron disease, we still don't know exactly what triggers MND. So you might ask yourself, why is it that we have been working so much on MND and we still don't know what is going on uh, in uh, these patients? So the answer to that partly lies in the fact that the animal models that we have used, historically used to study motor neuron disease are not sufficiently good to capture the complexity of the human brain. 
But there is uh, hope, and this hope lies in the fact that uh, there has been a lot of research going on uh, over the past few years, and today we are able to model MND using uh, human samples. And this is uh, thanks uh, to human stem cells. So um, the breakthrough that led to um, the discovery of human stem cells came from the work, partly from the work of those two people that you can see in the slide up here. One of them actually won the Nobel Prize for the work they've done. And the second one is the one uh, who created Dolly the Sheep, which you all know was actually born in Edinburgh at the Roslyn Institute. Um, so uh, Dolly the Sheep was a very um, important, uh, the, the day that Dolly the Sheep was born was a very important day because Dolly the Sheep was the first uh, mammal to be cloned uh, using uh, adult cell lines. Before Dolly the Sheep, scientists actually believed that an uh, adult fully developed cell line, such as for example the cells that we have in the brain, wasn't, was only able to do the job uh, they were doing, so brain cells could only be brain cells. But 10 years after Dolly the Sheep, uh, we actually discovered that this is not true. We discovered that it is possible to turn the clock back uh, into any fully developed specialized cell of the human body, and by using a uh, chemical cooker in the lab and only four ingredients, uh, we can actually take an adult cell and make this into a stem cell. And stem cells are very special kind of cells because stem cells are really able to create any pre cell present in our body. It can be a liver cell and can be a brain cell. So um, what we do in our lab essentially is to take cells from patients affected by motor neuron disease. Um, this is a very simple procedure because we can take these cells from the skin, from the blood, so it's really a non-invasive procedure for the patient. Um, and then we use these stem cells to grow brain cells. So very literally, we can grow brains in a dish to die. We will then use these cells uh, to start uh, some drug screening ex experiment, which I will tell you about just in a second, to essentially discover new therapies for MND. And because we take cells from both patients affected by MND and healthy control, we can then compare uh, their behavior and uh, look at what is the difference between these two cells. And here is why stem cells are such a great tool. Because these cells were coming from a patient with MND, we see in the lab that they display disease-specific signatures that make them uh, a really great model to study MND. Because in this way, we can bypass the um, studies in animals and we can just use human brain cells to test our treatments. Um, and here you can see what the cells look like under a microscope. You have a colony of stem cells, which is the starting material, and then you can see the brain cells down there. So these are uh, coming from the same uh, patient cell line, but you can see how these are very, very different kind of cells. Um, so I was telling you about the, the fact that these cells display disease-specific signatures. One of the main disease-specific signatures in MND is uh, what you can see up here. So in the cartoon up there, you can see in uh, light blue the image of a nerve cell. So what happens in uh, the majority of patients affected by MND, and in fact in 98% of people living with MND, is that there is this protein which you can see displayed in uh, red there, which we call TDP43, that for reasons that we still don't really completely understand, stop working as it should, and essentially becomes very sticky. When this happens, uh, the, ce the nerve cell starts being unhealthy, and essentially this in the end causes cell death. You can see there on the left what this looks like uh, under the microscope. You can see an MND patient brain cell with those very tiny protein clumps up there, which look like they aren't really not much, but these are very, very toxic uh, um, observations. And then you can see up on the right uh, um, a control where you cannot see those protein clumps. So during my PhD, what I did uh, essentially was to use this model to test uh, many drugs and in the hope to find a new treatment for MND. To do this, I used uh, a process that is called drug screening, where um, I was looking for essentially a therapeutic intervention that could reverse uh, that disease-specific uh, uh, process. 
Um, so in a drug screening, uh, all we are doing uh, is to take our cellular model and uh, to test uh, several thousands of drugs, uh, looking for the ones that could actually be um, positive compounds. So um, uh, this is uh, actually a process that until a few years ago was only possible in the largest pharmaceutical companies because it is a very um, expensive process. But because of all of the improvements uh, in uh, this technology today, basically every PhD student in pretty much each lab can run this, uh, this assay. Um, but because uh, we are testing many thousands of drugs, and in fact, I've tested 7,000 drugs over a few months during my PhD, we really need uh, high-level laboratory automation to do that, because it would be absolutely impossible for any human being to do that on their own. So you can see some images, some, sorry, some videos of all of our um, machines in action uh, up here. Um, so starting from uh, 7,000 compounds, which was the number of drugs I have initially tested, our primary drug screening identified uh, 131 drugs. That is, however, uh, just the first step of the process because the drugs that are identified into the initial screening uh, will have to then go through secondary validation experiments where essentially we're just making sure that the drugs are not toxic and we are looking at how these drugs are working. And uh, going through all of those steps, uh, we finally identified just five drugs that we think uh, could be repurposed for motor neuron disease. So here you can really see the gap. We started from almost 7,000 drugs and now we came down to five. This is why we really need to test so many drugs uh, in the hope we will find uh, a good one. Um, so this project is now um, developing a long list of drugs that will then be uh, considered for the MND Smart Clinical Trial. But I will leave that to Savanka to tell you uh, more about that. Thank you very much. You. That was excellent, Alessandra. Uh, you set it up very well. It's clear I've had nothing to do with this. It's all beautifully sequenced. So Savanka, MND Smart. Thanks, Nathan. So it's wonderful to be here this evening, really to share with you and us as a community of what we've delivered over the last couple of years um, with MND Smart. And you've heard today about how Judy and her team have transformed clinical care in Scotland and all of the lovely work going on in the laboratory to identify new treatments and understand the workings of the brain. Um, but really what people with MND want, obviously, is a treatment, um, a treatment that will slow the rates of progression of motor neuron disease. And I want to pause just at the beginning of my talk to reflect on some of the clinical aspects of motor neuron disease, just to really focus in on what the problem is that we're dealing with. So there are approximately 5,000 people living with motor neuron disease in the UK. 5,000 people, it doesn't seem like very many, but actually the lifetime risk of motor neuron disease is one in 300. And the harsh reality is that individuals who are diagnosed suffer from progressive problems with their speech, their swallowing, their arms and their legs and they ultimately experience pr problems with breathing and breathing failure. And, and one third of people, one third of people die within the first year of diagnosis, which is a horrendous statistic. The other thing we, need, we know now, and you've heard a lot about this in the symposium today, is that up to half of the people with motor neuron disease have significant problems with their memory um, and behavior as well. Against that background, we only have one treatment in the UK that's licensed for treating people with motor neuron disease, a drug called Rilizol, which was uh, licensed in 1995, so over 25 years ago. One drug which only extends life by two to three months. And this hasn't been through want of trying. There have been over 125 trials, clinical trials in the last decade, and they've tested over 76 different drugs, but none of these have led to a definitive new treatment. Also against this background, I've said that the, that the problem is a si significant one. Less than 5% of people living with motor neuron disease have had the opportunity to participate in a clinical trial. Less than 5%. So there's an urgent need, an urgent need for improved participation of people living with motor neuron disease, an urgent need for innovation in drug selection. You've heard the wonderful work that Alessandra, Karis, other people in the team are working hard on but also rethinking how we design clinical trials. The reason that the trials up until now have failed is because the design hasn't been conducive to getting the result that we need, a definitive result about whether a drug will have the ability to work, to slow down the rate of progression of people living with this condition, or whether it doesn't definitively. So if too few people have been in clinical trials, the duration of follow-up hasn't been long enough, the design has failed us. 
So the traditional trial design has been comparing one dummy drug, a placebo, against an active drug. And it takes a lot of time to test a drug in this way. You have to get regulatory approvals. You have to get sites around the country to be, be recruiting individuals. You have to follow participants up. You have to clean up the data. You then have to report on the data. All of this takes up to four years for one, one drug to test one drug in this way. So you can imagine if you wanted to test four drugs in this way, it will take a decade and a half to get the result that we're looking for. We've learned a lot by partnering with people who have significant ex expertise in a novel method of clinical trial design called a multi-arm, multi-stage trial design. Specialists who are world leaders in medical statistics um, from the MRC Clinical Trials Unit in London who had success with this method in cancer medicine and infectious diseases. We've learned a lot from COVID in the last two, two years about how things can be done quickly. And so this approach looks at multiple arms being tested at the same time against the standard of care. And you can see, using this approach, you can test multiple drugs in the same time frame, many, many, many drugs sooner. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to get definitive results quickly. And understanding the background to motor neuron disease drug trials, we understand that the majority of these treatments, unfortunately, will fail. But it's better to understand that and then move on to the next drug. And you've heard Alexandra's got a pipeline of these that we need to test in an efficient way. So MND SMART is the approach that we've taken to do this. It's a UK-wide study led from Edinburgh, but we're recruiting across 17 sites across the UK. It's a UK-wide study. And so we adopt, we've adopted this multi-arm approach where, where we're testing more than one active drug at the same time. We also have a new uh, methodology and innovation called adaptation, which means w that we're looking at the accumulating data throughout the duration of the study and making decisions about whether a treatment is working or not at an early stage and therefore saving the burden of participants being followed up with a drug that clearly isn't going to work. And that you can see that this is a big collaborative effort from so many of you in the room here, our foundational partners from uh, MND Scotland, the Doddy Foundation, the Ian McDonald Centre, I mentioned the MRC Clinical Trials Unit. We also have discovery scientists from the UK Dementia Research Institute and world leading medical st statisticians, they're really world leading from Warwick um, and the Clinical Trials Unit in, in UCL. So this is a, this is a major collaborative effort and, and the cartoon here summarizes the approach that we're taking. We're essentially studying two active drugs and a placebo to start with, but the aim, the aim before long is to add many, many more treatments and quickly. And so we're looking at two of the drugs and you heard from Alessandra about how these were selected and Caris and various other people have been working on, on, on selecting the right drugs to test in people. And we follow people up and we, we, we measure their functioning using a standard scale that's been validated for use in, 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 in MND called the ALS-FRS. And crucially also for these treatments, we need to know how they're impacting on, on people's survival. Are they extending the duration of life for people living with MND? That's the key thing that people with MND want and it's the, what, what the regulators want in terms of getting a drug licensed. So the final outcome will be looking at a measure of survival and functioning. But as I said before, we're looking as we go along, along the way at interim analysis points to make sure that the drugs that we're testing are worthwhile continuing to test for longer. All of this has been done. I mentioned all the people we're collaborating with. The key people we're collaborating with are people living with motor neuron disease. So throughout the whole process, and actually many years before we started recruiting our first participant, we've been listening very closely to what people with motor neuron disease want. I mentioned to you at the beginning that fewer than 5% of people with MND have participated in a trial in the UK. Overwhelmingly, every person that we see in the clinic with motor neuron disease wants to participate in research and wants the opportunity to take part in a clinical trial. And that's come through. They want, they want really what people who live with cancer have the opportunity for a discussion with their clinician about what trials are available. So the opportunity to participate is important. Also, inclusion criteria have been too narrow in historical trials. So we've purposely designed broad inclusion criteria. We want people to be followed up for as long as possible in studies. And historically, people have found it difficult to travel to clinic appointments and people have found it difficult to swallow medicine. So we've taken on board feedback from people living with MND and driven a number of innovations, including delivery of liquid drugs, delivered to people's homes, and even before COVID, we were pioneering the use of video conferencing to assess people, um, which is something we validated and are now delivering. COVID has obviously accelerated people's thinking, including our own, and again, we've, we've been dynamic in feedback from people living with MND, so we now consent people remotely. We did have the opportunity for people to come to clinic, and we still have that, but now we can consent people remotely and screen them remotely and randomize them remotely and follow up and this has allowed us to recruit a whole 
uh, load of extra participants that would never have been able to have the opportunity to take part in clinical trials uh, before. We're also continuously trying to reduce the burden of people living with MND who've got a lot of other things to get on with in their life. If they're having blood tests as part of the trial, we can share the results with clinicians. If we're doing cognitive screening tests, we can share that with clinicians. So it improves and enhances their clinical care as well. So we launched um, in the early part of 2020, just before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and we had an enormous amount of interest from people living with MND, and as you can see the media as well, we were very fortunate on the day of the launch to have uh, the headline story on the BBC 6 o'clock UK news and a lead story on the 10 o'clock news that day, and you can see from here the number of people that have registered. It's an overwhelming number of people living with MND in the UK who want to take part in this study. And this is the slide that I want you to take home, and, and all of everybody in this room has contributed to this success, really. We launched in February 2020, seven weeks after we launched the pandemic hit, just a few weeks actually, not seven weeks, seven after we launched the pandemic hit. We recruited seven participants during that time. There was a lockdown. We learned a lot during that process, and then trial recruitment restarted, and at pace, and this is all the work that's been driven by particularly Rachel Dakin and Amy Stenson from the trial office team. We've opened 17 sites, 17 sites across the UK. Many of these have never taken part in MND trials before. There have not been opportunities for people to take part in clinical trials, and now we've opened up sites all the way from Inverness in the north to Exeter in the south, all the way from Cardiff in the west, um, all the way to Norfolk and Norwich in the east. So we've, as a result of this, managed, despite the pandemic, to recruit 340 people, and our first interim analysis took part this spring. And we you can see from the trajectory of the graph here that we are actually pretty much following our pre-pandemic target, so we're not far off that at all. And we've recruited people all the way from the Isle of Orkney to the Isle of Wight, and that's never been done before in any neurological disorder. So we are uh, trying our best to be pioneering here. We've created a, a suite of, really a family of sites across the UK who are all really invested in delivering for this. And I mentioned before, only three of these sites have run NMND trials before at all. And you can see the positivity that's coming through from our, we've really developed a, a grouping of MND nurses, um, people living with MND, um, investigators, so 17 consultant neurologists who are part of our grouping now, who are motivated to work with us to get this done. So our first interim analysis was in March of this year, and the statisticians poured over the data um, over the first couple of months of this year, and we had our various trial committee meetings. Um, and a decision has been made to continue with recruitment and follow-up of, of existing participants um, to gather more information about whether any of the two drugs will slow down the rate of progression of MND. And our phase two, uh, sorry, stage two analysis will occur in the spring of next year. So what about next steps? So we're already working hard on our next protocol amendment to introduce our next active drug, which hopefully will be this autumn. And we're aiming to introduce another drug next year um, and then really every year after, perhaps one or two drugs even a year if Starfin has his way. Um, but really, this is um, what we're aiming to achieve, and it would be great to come back to you and talk to you about some of the results that we have next year. Thank you. That was great. You can see how this is all linked. So the last talk was from Emily. Um, we can wrap this up, and I think you've also got an acknowledgement slide. Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Emily and I'm here to talk to you about the future. What we're looking to keep achieving. So, as Savanka alluded to, the main success of MND Smart is that it's built on the feedback of people with MND. It aims to address these requirements and these issues that have led to trial issues in the past. Now we want to keep that going. So what we've involved is a sub-study where we look at people with MND and their caregivers and people who participate with them, because we don't believe that someone participates on their own, we want to find out their attitudes and experience to getting involved in a clinical trial at key stages in their trial journey. So we ask them to complete questionnaires as they progress through the trial at UK-wide sites, and then we also invite them to an interview with the Edinburgh team if they wish to do so when they withdraw. So this is their first prospective sub-study within a trial that looks at this kind of data. So we're hoping to use that kind of information to inform our trial design. The next aspect of the future I'm going to talk to you about is technology. So as we discussed before, the decentralisation of the trial has been helped by um, 
the opportunity to take it out of the clinic. So we're using these video conferencing technologies to avoid the need for people to come into clinic and reduce the burden so that people are able to participate in the trial if they want to, but if the burden was just too high before. Another opportunity that we have from technology is the opportunity to really expand the kind of data that we're looking at. So we can use things like apps and wearable devices to change the different kinds of ways that we look at M&D. So we can start to think about how we answer the research questions the trials have, which are, are these drugs affected? So we can use things like apps and wearable devices to shift that onus onto the participant to give us the kind of data that they think is important and we should know. It also helps us collect more detailed types of data. So we can collect it not only in the real life, but we can also collect it at much more frequent intervals. This obviously has huge implications for trial data. We're able to answer these research questions more effectively and more efficiently. So we've started to do this kind of thing in the clinic, but we wanna take it right back down to basics and find out if these kind of devices are suitable for people with MND. Everybody in this room knows MND is so complicated, it's so different person to person. So rather than assuming that these kind of wrist-worn devices that may, we may use in our day-to-day -day lives are suitable, we want to go back and ask to find out that direct feedback. So what we did was we asked 10 people with MND to wear these kind of devices for us. So we started off with the Actigraph accelerometer. So that's a small kind of watch size device that people kindly wore on their wrist and ankle for 24 hours, uh, for one day a week, for a 12 week period. So we invited them to provide feedback at key points in this study on how they find using this kind of device. So an accelerometer is quite interesting, particularly for MND, and that it tells us about how the limb moves in space. So you can see in a condition like MD that has different impacts, so may slow movement in an arm or in a leg, now we can start to understand a little bit more in detail rather than relying on questionnaires. But primarily our focus here was on the acceptability. So we were asking people to do quite new things with these devices. We were asking them if they were able to put them on themselves, if they needed caregivers to get involved. We were also asking them if they found them comfortable to wear and if they were able to wear them whilst they were asleep. As we were quite interested to see if the sleep data um, would tell us anything about how often people with MND were waking up during the night, potentially indicative of some respiratory issues. So we were also interested to find out about these standardized motor assessments. So that was really helpful so that we could track the progress person to person, week to week, and also compare within individuals. So we just finished this study um, and I'm pleased to report that the feedback was fantastic. The people with MND who were involved were really motivated. Um, I think quite a lot of people are always surprised that we're not doing this kind of technology and you know it's becoming more and more ubiquitous in day-to-day -day life and um, so yes we're super grateful to that but we're definitely still analyzing the motor data so I have nothing to report on that side yet but the feedback is the most important and that was positive. So that brings me quite nicely onto our acknowledgement slide. The people with MND are the ones that we need to thank. These are the participants, the people giving up their time. Um, but we also want to thank the other researchers and the collaborations throughout, and most importantly, our funders. Again, nothing could be done without this. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great. I, I hope you've got a snapshot. I what I just wanted to say is thank all the speakers. The talks were terrific. They are linked. I think there's a common thread, and the common thread is in order to make advances in this condition, you need to map it, understand it, you need to work in participation with people living with the disease. That's your most powerful asset. Okay? And I think that's why starting with Judy, who spoke about the platform which is called Care MND, is so important. It's small because it's from Scotland, but it's beautifully proportioned. 
and it's um, it's a phenomenon which we need to understand and talk about more. And then you had a series of talks that stitched together. And the final talk of Emily really does presage the future, which is the explosion of digital. And the idea that you need to bring people with these tough condition into a clinic and navigate car parking appointments and all the rest of it for a 20 minute snapshot assessment is yesterday's story. We can use now technologies, all of which we have in our phones, to get repeated high frequency, high value data that can give us meaningful uh, numbers, quantification about what's happening to people. So that, that's the point. So digital is the key. So, and digital meeting MND. The other thing I, I, I should say for all of us, uh, and for everyone in this room, and for politicians as well, I think without question, motor neuron disease will be the pathfinder for dementia. Uh, of itself, it is very important, but if you get it right, it's today MND, it will be tomorrow dementia. Uh, my prediction will be um, MND, the breakthroughs will come in part from Scotland. In some ways, we will contribute, we may lead, we might follow, but we will uh, do something, we are doing something. Uh, and MND Smart, I think, is a brilliant example of Scottish innovation which has b been taken across the UK and is increasingly being cited and adopted globally. Okay? So there's nothing parochial about this. The only reason I say this is because in my time in Scotland, sometimes we're unaware or we're shy to speak of success. We shouldn't be. It's not the same as being arrogant. It's quietly confident. And we're absolutely duty bound to do this for, because of the people who've got this condition. Every year there's another 150 to 200 people diagnosed with motor neuron disease in Scotland. Over the last two decades, 20 years, uh, less than five, five, not percent, people in Scotland entered a drug trial. It's outrageous. Can you imagine me standing here and saying, you've got cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, less than one percent? I mean, I'd, I'd be run out of town. I'd probably be in front of the GMC. So I want to emphasize this is a team effort, we're all together, but it started with Donald and Ewan McDonald. So I want us all to recognize that Ewan can't be here today, but Donald is here. So thank you very much. <laughs> Donald, Donald wants to say something. Great. Thank you, Donald. Um, <coughs> I'm conscious of the time. No, you're uh, fine. Uh, you're fine. You oh, take your time. Uh, you don't know what you're opening up and giving me lots of time. <laughs> but, uh, this is a totally unscripted uh, thank you um, to Siddharth and, and all the presenters. I think it's been fantastic. Um, every six months or so, you and I uh, get a similar number of, of five or six papers uh, presented to us. I'm very glad that I don't have to sit and examine them after the have to hear them because they're quite complicated. But one message I am very strong about is invest in young people with talent. There's always a one that can always use more money. And without money, yes, the progress will be a lot uh, slower. But key is uh, uh, getting really bright, uh, fresh people attacking this disease. What uh, One tiny uh, final little thing. About 12 years ago, Ewan has got a history degree and a law degree from Edinburgh. As befits somebody with that sort of background, when he discovered, just like that, that he had MND, he went to town and studying everything he could find on MND, and he couldn't find very much, as is fair to say. Um, one researcher said to him one day, Ewan, if you get any ideas, Give, it, give me a shout because we get stale. And I thought that was unbelievably depressing. I don't think that's the case now, as can be seen with all the people here in, in, in the room. So um, it's a very rambly thank you, but all the best and no, keep going. You. Yeah, we will. Yeah.